I distinctly remember seeing on Facebook, would you like to create impact through science? And then inside I was like, oh yeah, that sounds like something I'd like to do. So I just signed up straight away. The opportunities that it seemed to provide from the short little description on the website just it's just worth having a crack, see if you can get in. So when I heard about this course, it was like my dream course come to life. It was kind of like, you know, people who love science but want to work in other areas of society applying their scientific knowledge, which is what I want to do. So yeah, it just sounded perfect to me, so I applied straight away. Being able to embody science and communicate that to affect some sort of change, uh, it just sort of knew it was for me from the get-go. There's a real disconnect between what government is doing and what they want to achieve and what's happening in the academic sector. So where we're looking at is how can we better um, provide international aid to the Indo-Pacific region. And so there are currently many innovations happening within the university sector that are really pioneering in this field but the government is simply unaware of what's going on. And these innovations and technologies can really help improve the way that aid is given out. The more I've done it, the more I've seen that um, not only government, but um, the corporate world really um, relish getting academic involvement in their work. And it's something that there's quite a divide between. And so I guess that's why this course was founded in the first place. It was to bridge that gap between um, non-science and science. And so um, I'm looking to use the skills I learned um, this semester, particularly in academic engagement in um, whatever I do in the next couple of years. So there's some pretty awesome research that goes on at universities that tends towards um, the academic side, but some have some really practical applications if the academics are guided towards the solutions that they could help. We're currently working on a project with the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine and looking at um, how can we optimise the drug policy that Monash currently has um, to improve the outcomes for students, so reduce the amount of harm that students um, are facing when it comes to drug use and try and give them more support than they currently face. There's about 500 illegal drugs at the moment on the market um, around the world and then there's sort of one new one every week or 100 a year. And so the challenge is how can we identify, monitor and educate for these drugs um, that we don't even know about or on the market. And so I looked at different mechanisms of identifying and tracking drugs and different data points we have in Australia. So if we can find a way to be alert of what new drugs are on the market, then we can influence policy and also education materials. I hope that it goes to the Monash executives and they read it and start thinking about the changes that they really need to be making and getting in line with the current trends. And really taking on board that drug harms are real. It doesn't have to be a chore, it should be something that as, as human beings that we look after each other. Um, and yeah, when you put something on the table that can help people, you should use it. Most of our society believes that prohibition or an abstinence approach is the best way to get people to stop taking drugs and to stop people dying on our streets and violence and all those kinds of harmful consequences that we see associated with drugs. But the statistics show it's the complete opposite. Accepting that people are going to continue to take drugs and then looking at ways that we can you know, help them to do it safely is actually the best way to reduce all of those factors. And it's definitely important for us to start communicating that information. We started with the Eliminate Dengue program, now called the World Mosquito Program. And my focus was particularly in the environmental footprint. So I started looking into, okay, where is waste coming from within the program, where can that be reduced? And that led to looking at their larval feeding system, so the diet that they feed the larvae. And we found that they're currently feeding them with a beef-based diet. So I wanted to look into more environmentally conscious, sustainable sources such as insects. When we started our project, the way that they were delivering eggs was just on little pieces of fabric with a tablet of food, so they were separated. So we wanted to figure out, is there an easier way that we could possibly even just 
mail these eggs off to people to then release themselves. So that led us to looking into little um, water soluble capsules. My aspect will be focusing on the community, how we can engage them, how we can get them on board, what are our media marketing materials that we need to make sure that the public are aware and the public accept what we're doing and are willing to participate. From current conversations, it would be based around consultations with the church groups because they're a very collective sort of society. Also the local council and then the community groups as they operate around a Mani Arbor, which is sort of like a meeting place. In terms of secondary community engagement strategies, it would be radio, social media, hosting events, dances, that sort of thing to make sure that the public see our presence. The opportunity to travel to Kiribati made me really understand the scale of problems that are out there. It's a small little country island which is highest point is three metres above sea level. And so when people start talking about climate change and the seas rising, all of a sudden this had a real world context of these people are building sea walls because they don't have any other choice. I think that really spoke to me about the impact that I could have. The reason we chose to do a handbook and to do a film was because we felt this was the most effective way of actually creating a positive impact in this industry and in this sector. There's a lot of papers, there's a lot of research which is out there, but there is a disconnect between the academia and the actual farmers. They're just super excited and passionate about having young people come and actually learn about what they're doing. Farmers are incredibly busy people, they, they have so much to do. but. They've allowed us onto their farms, sometimes up to 12 hours, like a huge whole chunk of their day, their whole day pretty much. Coming into this project, I thought, right, well, here's a system, the beef cattle system. It's quite resource intensive. Let's see if we can make this a little bit more efficient. I understand it's super financially supportive of Australia. So how can we capitalise on this financial sector within Australia? whilst also trying to make that system a little bit more environmentally friendly moving into the future. To get more Victorians engaging with nature and biodiversity, that's been our main goal. And to do that, we've been getting them to go out, take pictures of rainbow lorikeets and their nests. We want to get an understanding of where they're nesting, because they nest in the hollows of trees. But we wanted to see a little bit, maybe are they living in buildings? Where, where are they living? Like, why are they thriving so well and moving so far inland? So that's what we're trying to find out a little bit as well while we're doing this. A lot of people who have engaged in Where's Laurie in our project haven't really got a passion for rainbow lorikeets as such or even science or been engaged before. But they've engaged in our project because whether they, they want to win a prize or maybe it's because they know us. It's kind of a blueprint for other citizen science projects so we think we're going to get more out of it from the citizen science point of view rather than the rainbow lorikeet point of view. So they're going to pick and choose the bits they like and put them in their next citizen science project. This project is really focusing on community engagement for a reason um, because 30 to 50 percent of water and sanitation projects fail after five to seven years um, and a large part of that I believe is due to one lack of operation maintenance which is what our thesis is on um, but it's also largely attributed I think um, to lack of community engagement being done properly. Access to water at the moment is sometimes through piped networks but then they'll often sit at the edge of settlements and then residents will lay their own piping through the community and this is often really low grade piping which can then get cross-contamination and all sorts of other issues but the key challenge around this project is not so much the water supply it's really the sanitation and the flooding and the drainage that are huge huge issues. You then need to put where all this water is coming from, you need to put that somewhere. So that kind of involves what's called green technology. But what boils down to using plants, using organic matter, wetlands, primarily to then put this water somewhere to reuse, whether that's to try and grow your own food, um, whether that's to actually extract the water so you can use it, to try and get as much value out of these things, rather than just trying to protect the, um, the community, it's trying to empower them so they can use it in a different way. So I'd really love to be able to see in five years time that the work we did on this trip in Fiji um, actually created positive outcomes.
people I've done this course with have become my best friends over the last four years and I think we've been in really close contact over the last four years and we've developed friendships, we've had memories together and I have some really great mates in this um, cohort that I depend on for everything and I think we're going to be close mates for years to come definitely. I think it's really getting stuck into big complex issues. So things like providing water and sanitation to informal settlements. Things like in first year I looked at fracking policy and mining policy. These are huge issues that a lot of the time university students will really kind of, obviously we haven't done a lot, but we've at least scratched the surface and had a look. A lot of the time you just end up glossing over these, you might just talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes. We've actually had the chance to really dive into them and give it a bit of a go. Obviously we haven't quite solved all of them just yet. Almost the more you know, the more difficult it can become. But I've seen people who, you know, brilliant people who have this understanding and this knowledge but use it as a motivator to drive and to do more rather than seeing it from a defeatist sort of perspective. Going through this process you see people going out and doing um, really interesting innovative things and you're exposed to all these different like innovative and disruptive ways of thinking and doing so um, I think that reflecting back I've definitely got a lot of skills and I could um, looking forward to the potential different avenues that I could go into to have that impact is so much beyond I, what I thought was possible. What's actually important to me, like what do I hold as in terms of my values and morals and then how can I then intertwine that with the work that I want to do in the future and somehow make an impact in the community. Use science as a mechanism to touch in different worlds, so how can science be involved in business, how can science be involved in government, how can we use these skills to change thinking and disrupt what's going on and I think that alone is um, really powerful and profound that uh, yeah, I would recommend to anybody to pursue this because it's, it's different but you get, you're equipped with enterprise skills that will last you for a lifetime. Most people come up to me and go, oh you're doing environment save the world course, aren't you? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs>